Hey folks, aside from the controversy of whether or not we should be rarefying our data, in the recent episodes I have been talking about how rarefaction works, what is the math behind it, conceptually what's going on. Uh, two episodes ago I showed you how we can use the choose function and factorials to get the pure math, the exact computation of the expected number of tacks that we would see for a smaller sampling depth than what you may have gotten experimentally. That way then we can compare samples uh, richnesses on an equal footing, an equal level of sampling effort. In the last episode then, I showed you how uh, the conceptual idea of a collector's curve, where you might go into a bag of uh, candies or go out into a field and sample individuals, and as you're sampling individuals, you keep track of how many new things do you see, and you generate a collector's curve, right? And on the x-axis, you can think of number of individuals sampled, the y-axis, the number of new types sampled, right? And so we talked about how, uh, you know, that that profile of sampling uh, new taxa versus sampling effort is a random process. And so if you repeated it again, uh, you'd get a different shaped curve. And so what rarefaction curves really are is repeating that collector's curve process, say a hundred or a thousand times, and generating the average curve through all those collector's curves. In general, I'm not super interested in a rarefaction curve. I don't need to know the expected number of taxa I would have seen for every possible number of individuals that I could have sampled. It's just not that relevant to me. Typically what I would do is pick a threshold, say 2,000 in individuals or 10,000 individuals, and then I would want to know uh, how many taxa would I see at that sampling depth across all of my samples. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, is empirically how can we pick a threshold sampling depth and then get the expected number of taxa for that sampling depth. We'll do this empirically and we'll compare it back to the exact solution using that rarefy function we created a few episodes back. Here I am in our studio. I have my rarefaction.r script open and ready to go. You can get your own copy so you can follow along. It's really the best way to learn this stuff. Uh, you can get the code, the data, uh, at a link down below in the description. Also, I'll leave some instructions here so you can get caught up uh, by using all that information in the blog post. So as we've seen, I have loaded the library, the tidyverse, I'm setting a random number generator seed, and then I've got some code here to read in data from a mouse study that my lab published a number of years ago. Again, if you want more information about that study, down below in the description you'll find some information. Anyway, this generates a tibble a sh called shared that has a column for the sample ID or what I call group, the name of the taxa, in my case it's gonna be OTUs, and then a column for the values which is the number of times each OTU was seen in each sample. And then I've got my rarefy function here, which does the exact computation of the expected number of taxa I would see for a given sampling depth and for a given frequency distribution. I'm gonna load all this. Uh, there's other stuff in this script that was went into generating those rarefaction curves and collector's curves that I'm not gonna worry about too much today. Um, and so again, if we look at shared, we see this three column data frame. So when I'm taking on a problem like this, I try to kind of make things as simple as possible before I expand them out. So in this case, what I'll do is filter my data to only look at the group um, samples that were from F3D0. And so now I have the 1588 rows that correspond uh, to that sample. I think I'll also go ahead and limit to the values greater than zero. Uh, there are some zero values in here. And so we see there's 167 different taxa that have observed counts. What I'd like to do is to deconvolute this data frame. Now we saw this in the previous episode that I can take that value column, so like that 115 for OTU1, and I can uncount the data so that I then replicate OTU1 115 times, OTU2 26 times. So again, we can do uncount on a value. And so again, I see that I've got OTU1 a whole bunch of times, right? And so now what I want to do is I want to subsample out this data frame to get out 800 and 1,828 rows randomly selected from my data frame. And so I can do this with sample n, uh, sample n function, and I can say size equals um, 1828. And now I can count the number of distinct OTU names. I talked about this in the last episode where I, I needed like a cumulative and distinct function, but I didn't have one. So what instead I'll do is a summarize, uh, and I will say S for number of species or number of taxa uh, equals N distinct, and if this is the name column. 
And so I get back a value for S of 130. So now I'm going to try to scale out to all the samples. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this line 73. I also don't need that value greater than zero because when I do the uncount, if, uh, if an OTU has a count of zero, it's not gonna be deconvoluted zero times, or it's gonna be deconvoluted zero times so it doesn't show up, right? So I'll go ahead and remove that line. So in here, I'll add a group by group, right? And I'll pipe that into my uncount. And let's give that a run and see what we get. Well, sure enough, we get 227 rows, one for each of our samples, with the number of observed taxa. Now you'll notice that this number is fluctuating that I had for F3D0 above. I think it was 126 and now it's 119. Again, that's because the sample n function is using a random number generator. So if I run this multiple times, I'm gonna get different values every time I run it. And so that's why I need to repeat this, say 100 or 1000 times, so that I can get a sense of what is the central tendency? What is the average number of taxa I would see if I got 1828 sequences from all of my samples. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this into a function that I can then replicate any number of times. So I will call this subsample, uh, it'll be a function. So I'll give this data, which will be the data frame that I'm bringing in to, like I have shared here, and then I'll have sample size uh, for the number of sequences that I want to subsample down to. And I'll create my curly braces to define the body of that function. And I'll bump that over and instead of shared, again, I want data. And instead of 1828, I want sample size, right? And so now if I do load that, so I should be able to take subsample um, on shared and 1828. And I then get output much like what I had before. So again, now we need to replicate this a bunch of times. And what we can do is we can replicate this using the map DFR function. So I could do map DFR. And the values that I want to iterate over, let's do one to 10. Again, a nice small data set, so we're not waiting a long time only to find error messages. And we'll put a tilde in front of that subsample. And then I want an ID column that I'll call iters. And then I'll close that with the parentheses. Running that, we now get 2,270 rows. So again, there are 227 samples, 10 times replicates. And so I will then call this subsamples, or maybe subsamplings, right? And then I can take subsamplings and I can then feed that into a group by um, group and then summarize on, um, I'll say S being the mean of S. I believe this column was S, right? Yep, it is. So we'll run that. And so then we get our rarefied values for each of the different groups. I'll call this empirical. And then I also want an exact. And so I'll take shared and then feed that into a group by group, and then summarize um, S equals rarefy. And then my rarefy is the data coming through and uh, the sample, so it'll be 1828. Um, actually, that X is gonna be value. So I want the value column, the, the number of counts for each OTU in each sample. And so now I get my, yeah, I get my exact, so I'll call this exact. We see the values here look fairly similar to what we got for the empirical before. And what I can do is I can go ahead now and bring those together. And so previously I might do this with a join. Let me show you a different way, and that's with bind rows. So I can bind two data frames together uh, row-wise. So one will be at the, the top rows, one will be the bottom rows, if they have the same column names. And so exact um, has group and S, and empirical also has group and S. So I can then bind rows with empirical, and I'll say empirical equals empirical, uh, and then exact equals exact. And the reason I'm naming the data frames this way is because I can then have an ID column that will then be approach. Uh, and so as you'll see, we now have a column for the approach where it's empirical um, or further down exact. And what we could then do is we can then say, um, plot the points uh, with like a slope plot, right? Uh, my favorite plot. <laughs> We've seen a lot of me making slope plots in the past. So we'll do ggplot AES x equals, um, and we'll do approach. So we'll have exact and empirical. And then y will have s, and we'll have group equals group. So we'll connect the points by their group, and then we'll do geom line. And so as we can see, the lines look pretty flat. Um, we are only using 10 iterations. So there's a bit of noise, I would say, in the data. But I'd like to go ahead and build out these plots, kind of build out our analysis before we scale up to a larger number 
of um, rarefaction steps. So that's one approach we could look at. I don't know that's super useful. Another approach would be to put the exact values on the x-axis and the empirical on the y and represent each group with a different point, and we'd expect them to fall on a straight line. So let's go ahead and um, take this line again. Uh, and this might be a case where it would be useful to use inner join instead because I'm going to want exact and empirical in separate columns. But uh, we'll go ahead and use a pivot wider instead. Uh, so we'll do pivot wider. Uh, I'd encourage you to experiment using the inner join uh, to see if you can do that instead of bind rows and pivot wider. Again, we'll get to the same place here. Um, and so what I will do is names from, and it'll be approach, and then values from equals s. So sure enough, we now have an empirical and exact column. I can then do ggplot and then aes x equals exact, y equals empirical, and we'll do geom point. And yep, they fall on a pretty good line. Let's go ahead and add in here a geom ab line. And so geom ab line allows you to indicate the slope and intercept. So we'll say intercept equals zero, slope equals one, and I'm gonna make the color uh, gray. And I will add that, and I'm going to go ahead and add um, theme light. Uh, and I've got to spell light right. <laughs> and let's go ahead and add uh, theme light to this previous plot as well uh, for our slope plot. And this is, again, what our plot looks like with the, um, the ideal case where the values are identical uh, going in behind there. So the final way I'd like to look at the data is by looking at the percent error of the empirical relative to the exact. So again, I'm going to take these two lines, 97 or 98, um, and we will then go ahead and do a mutate on to create a column called error. And I'll say 100 times, and we'll do um, exact minus empirical divided by exact. Yep, and so then that gets us our percent error. And then I'm going to feed this into making a geodensity plot. And so we'll do ggplot. AES x equals error, and then we'll do plus geom density, and I'll go ahead and do theme light, and there we go. We see that we have central tendency right at zero, maybe a little bit to the right of zero. Uh, we could get that exact value by again borrowing uh, these first three lines of this latest pipeline, um, and we could then do a summarize with uh, mean. Uh, of mean of error, and we could do SD on the SD of error, and we see that our average error rate is right at zero, right? That's 0.00577%, so it's pretty small, but we do see kind of a wide spread in the data. We have a standard deviation of just over one. Now let's repeat this going back up, and instead of using 10, let's use 100 and see what happens to the shape of these different plots as well as the mean and standard deviation. We can see that our mean is still pretty close to zero. Our standard deviation has gone from just over one to under 0.4, right? So before we had um, 0.00577, 1.19, uh, and now we're a smaller uh, variation from the mean, and our st standard deviation is quite less. If we go over and look at our figures, before this geom density plot went out to plus or minus two, and now we're kind of at plus or minus one, uh, similarly, if we scale back here, looking at putting exact on the X and empirical on the Y, those points are a lot tighter. Um, and here again was our slope plot, and we can see that those slopes uh, just kind of visually look a lot more horizontal, although there certainly is still some kind of uh, vertical variation, if you will. Let's go now and do a thousand iterations. So repeating that code with a thousand iterations, we see that we still have a very small mean right at zero, and our standard deviation went from like 0.33 down to 0.121. And so as we increase the number of iterations, again, the standard deviation is going to keep dropping. Looking at our density plot, um, we again see a bell-shaped curve kind of centered just to the left of zero, as we would have expected from that summary output. Um, and we notice that our curve uh, started at plus or minus two when we had 10 iterations down to one, and now down to about plus or minus 0.4 or so. And if we look at this um, plot with the exact value on the X and the empirical on the Y, those values look pretty dead on, um, as does this slope plot looking uh, pretty flat for all those different values.
So usually people are pretty content with a thousand or a hundred iterations. As we can see, there's not a huge difference in the values that you will get for the same data. Again, I hope you found this progression of episodes useful. Two episodes ago, we talked about the exact solution for calculating the estimated number of taxa we would see for any sampling depth for a given uh, frequency distribution. In the last episode, we saw how we could make collector's curves and then convert those into refraction curves. Again, the refraction curve is the average of a whole bunch of collector's curves. And then in this episode, we hone down into a single um, sampling depth that we want to then look at across all of our different samples. Of course, there are many different ways to do the same thing that I've done here. What I would encourage you to do is, of course, as always, do this with your own data, but I would encourage you after watching this and kind of running through the code with me to start with a blank script and to repeat the analysis that I did. See if you can write your own code to rarefy the data and then compare it back to the exact solution and see if you get the right value, right? See if you get a value that's really close to the exact value that would have been predicted from the mathematical theory. If you can do that, then you've definitely mastered a whole bunch of concepts beyond what is rarefaction, and that's what's really important here. Again, the ability to think through a problem and pull together the different tools that we have at our disposal here in R. So practice with that exercise, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.